conversations off. All right. Totally. All right. See you in the room. Thank yeah. you. Bye. Bye. Hey, everyone. Let's see. Oh, we're live yet. Uh, the audience is so engaging. My goodness. There are so many oh, comments crap, there. <laughs> hey, we are live. Everyone, I wanted to do a special introduction to my next guest, and that is Dwayne. And Dwayne is a VP of Industry Insights at Yext. So Dwayne has been an industry expert for over 10 years. You can tell by his gray hair. Hey, I also have gray hair, so nothing not, nothing against of that. That's, all, that's all you people Bing, out there, right there. He, <laughs> he launched Bing's Webmaster Tools program. He ran SEO at MSN. Um, he also has published two books. So overall, you can tell why he has some gray hair. <laughs> uh, Dwayne, so excited to have you here. Uh, share with us what it is that you're going to talk about. You know, this is, um, I'm super excited to be here. First off, everyone, thank you so very much. Um, I'm coming to you live and unfiltered from just outside of Los Angeles, California this morning. And I'm going to be talking to you guys very quickly, but covering a lot of ground on the topic of our next generation of search, why knowledge crafts of the future. And if I can fit it in, I'm gonna introduce you guys to the concept that I call the splinter net. It's not my word. I'm taking it from something that was going on in the nineties, but I'm repurposing it. So that's what I'm gonna go through. It's gonna be high intensity. It's gonna be fast paced. I'm gonna to try to stack a lot into this 20 minutes. So worst case scenario, if people need me, track me down afterwards, I'm easy to find as you will find out. <laughs> Sounds good, everyone. Okay, I am leaving you guys, and you can start sharing your screen. Awesome. Natalie, thank you very much. Here we go, everyone. Three, All two, right. one. There we go. We are going to talk the future evolution of search and how AI search is empowering the customer journey. So let me get into this, okay? First off, you guys already know who I am, Dwayne Forrester, VP of Industry Insights. If you need me, at Dwayne Forrester on Twitter gets me. I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me everywhere. Just type me into your favorite search engine, which I hope is Bing. <laughs> and then we can go from there. Now, very quickly, I'm going to run some stats by you guys. 80% of emerging consumers are more digital than they were pre-pandemic, it turns out. And they predict they're going to prefer digital channels following this crisis if and when this crisis ever wraps up. So 90% of customers say that they use search at every stage of the customer journey. Now think about yourself. Every time you're somewhere or you're researching something, you go out to buy something or you're at home, you're usually multiple screening this. You got your computer up, you got your phone up, you're looking at different things, you're comparing stuff. Or if you're like me, you're standing around a place like Home Depot looking at a product going, do I want this one or do I want to order the other one and wait a couple of days for it to show up? I don't know. But that's what we're doing now all about search at every stage. And I know in our case, the data that we've seen is an increase in conversions, 126% generally year over year increases, clicks that answer questions instead of giving people keyword links. Now I want you to think about that on two levels, okay? One, I want you to think of what you think of first when I say the search experience. So a Google search results page, I know Tyler called, uh, talked about SERPs earlier this morning. And so when you think about what a search engine results page looks like, I want you to think about the list of links on there. And I want you to think of the featured snippet at the very top, the answer to the question. Now, I also want you to think about that in terms of, hey, when people come to my website and they use my search built into my website, are they getting that same experience or do I suck? Because when you make those changes and you mirror that type of experience, this is the uplift that you see. Big, big opportunities in here. And essentially, Customers are more digital, they use search at every stage and they want answers. They don't want links, they want answers. And this is a very psychological thing because if you think about that SERP page with the answer box at the top of it, you know exactly what's happening here. I clicked, I got my answer, wow, that feels great. And then I click on the provider of that answer if I wanna go deeper. There's virtually no difference than if you clicked on a keyword link and you actually went to that same web page and read that same information. But psychologically speaking, we feel great that Google just gave us the answer and we expect it more and more in more areas. Now, there are real challenges for this consumer experience. And part of that challenge is this, the information overload paradox. The more information we have, the less our ability to process exists. I want you to think about the last time you were physically in a grocery store, you walked down an aisle and you were looking for a can of soup 
or a bag of popcorn or heaven forbid, a soda. And you realized there's a massive amount of choice. You suddenly went into overload. I don't know which one to pick. There are too many. Studies time and again have shown if you draw that number down, if you shorten that list, you make it easier, make fewer choices, people will feel better and make choices faster. Ultimately, what this leads to, though, for the search engines is this opportunity to explore versus exploit. Now, the explore part of this, this is what we think of when we're doing search. We're researching, we're exploring for information, we're trying to find answers, but we're looking at an all-up storyline, a bigger narrative, if you will. Now, where the exploit comes in is when you're taking an action, okay? And I'm going to show you what these actually look like, all right? So I did a search dinner near me and I proxied myself into Florida because I felt like, hey, why not? Boca Raton, shout out to Florida. But this is what happens. Seven billion results. Now I know they're not all near me. Let's be clear about that, right? Like as populated as that area is with little restaurants, <laughs> there's not that many of them. But Google seems to feel good about showing me that there's this massive number, which kind of leads me immediately as I scan this page to go into a bit of a paralysis because my mind sees that. It sees all those commas and all those zeros and it says, holy crap, I got a lot of work to do. What do I do? And it starts to freeze down, which then Google very strategically puts the exploit in place to get you to take that action. The action being, look, there's a map. Let me simplify this for you. Look, there's three items on this map that stand out more than the rest. Let Why don't you make a choice based on this? Now, there's a lot of data and a lot of information flowing into this and why Google is showing what's in this order. All of these things are filtered through its algorithms and its AI to help fix this list that you see. But this is what the information overload paradox and the exploit shows up like. Now, here's a couple other examples real quick. Flight to New York, got ads up top, and then a Google-controlled exploit. All kinds of stuff going on here. You know there's lots of choices. Let me make it easy for you. And you get into their guided experience. Hotels, again, same thing. First thing you see, ads. Then you see the exploit. Quick sidebar on ads, by the way, and I want the audience to go out and do some research on this. I came across something last year. I've been struggling to find it again. But I came across something last year. It was a study that was done, I think in 2020 or 2019, that showed that younger generations, so trailing millennials, Gen Z, are actually showing an increase in trust in paid ads. So when they are using their mobile phone and they're seeing paid ads, their trust in the ad is increasing and it's getting close to a level of trust that we place in organic listings. Go look that stuff up, guys. Um, I'm continuing to look it up. If anybody finds it, ship it over to me uh, because it is that to me is going to be a game changer. It's a huge indicator of where we end up in the future. Now, if we look at a mortgage calculator, we see the exact same pattern. Ads, Google controlled exploit. These are areas they're just taking over and they're owning outright because it's a high value space, right? They're even moving into broader areas like sinusitis, right? What are the symptoms of sinusitis? Now, all of a sudden, you've got this exploit right across the top. What else would you like to get into? Because there's nothing quite like a cozy, rainy Thursday afternoon, curled up on your sofa, self-diagnosing why you don't feel 100% today. That is something we all love to do so that we can psych ourselves out for our weekend. But that's okay. Ultimately, it's all leading in a direction. And where is it heading? Well, if we actually look at game theory, we see that there's a couple of different strategies at play here. One is what's called an optimal strategy, and the other is known as an optimistic strategy. So the optimal strategy is the type of strategy employed in what would be called curated search, when a goal is known and certain questions will lead to an ideal experience. So this you can think of as a branded search, if you will. If I know exactly the brand that I want and I want to go there, but I'm looking for information maybe that's like, are they busy right now? Or what's the price? That kind of idea. The optimistic strategy, however, this is where things like natural language search are applied. And this is when the goal is less well known and the questions could be anything. Now, you're really actually very familiar with this, especially if you're of my generation, because... The game, guess who, relies heavily on this. And if you're not familiar with that game, go ahead and look it up. It was a fun game back in the 70s, 80s, and maybe into the 90s for some folks. But really, it was all about asking non-specific questions to understand who the person was you were talking about 
in the game. Now, when you ask, what questions can you ask and guess who? If you begin on the optimal strategy, which is Google search, this is what you end up seeing, right? And you could go, I'm feeling lucky, which is the optimistic strategy, but let's take a look at the optimal strategy, right? So when you click on this, this is what you get back. You get an answer box back and it tells you, you can't ask subjective questions like, do you look funny? But instead can only ask questions about specific attributes of the character. Uh, basically each question must have a definitive answer. Now, again, you're drawn to this answer at the top of the page because right above it is this big number that is the overload paradox where you're sitting there saying, wow, there's a lot to it. I better just read the answer I'm given. But there's so much more to this, okay? Underneath this, this people also asked, this is Google's opportunity. In fact, any search engine's opportunity, any business's opportunity to build the world's collection of optimal strategies. And for Google, what they do is they ask these ancillary or secondary questions and they see how often people engage with them. So if question one, is what questions can you ask and guess who, then over millions of iterations, millions of tests that Google runs on this, it will know exactly what else people also ask. And therefore it will know exactly what to populate to be most useful. And from there, it can actually determine which exploits should be added into this. Now, if we actually take a look at this and we go for something that's a little more practical and a little deeper, and we're gonna talk about a long tail query here, but unfortunately we gotta go away from game and we gotta get into something that's very real world, right? So in this case, I want an IHA doctor near me who speaks Spanish and takes Aetna. There's a lot in that, but these are the types of queries that we see growing massively year over year. These very long tail, very specific queries. Now, when you do an optimal strategy on this, this is what you're faced with. So imagine you are the doctor and you are trying to be found in this, okay? All you see right up front as a consumer is advertising. Now, obviously this meets the goals for, in this case, Google, the search engine, Bing would have a similar setup and everybody would be doing this, right? But in this world, the ad gets the chance to win at every step of the optimal strategy here. Now, if you actually come in here and you hit, I'm feeling lucky, watch what happens. So a single click on I'm feeling lucky, because I'm willing to bet nobody here has clicked on I'm feeling lucky in a long time, but you're gonna after this. Because right now, only about 1% of people click on I'm feeling lucky, and it's only available on desktop. You can't see it on mobile. But here's what happens. You ask this question, and then you hit I'm feeling lucky, and Google immediately takes you to the URL, takes you directly to the website of the doctor that is the best answer to meet that question. There is no set of results. It's just this answer. This is massively powerful. Obviously, this is problematic for Google's ad revenue. So they're quite, I'm sure, happy that 1% of people click on this on desktop. But let's take a look at that for a second. If you actually go back and look at what their ad revenue was over the last year, you'll realize doing the basic math that Google is losing about $580 million a year in revenue when people click on I'm feeling lucky. Now, to you and me, that's a lot of money, absolutely. But realistically, all up for Google, who makes billions of dollars in a quarter, they can easily afford to have this go away. And from a machine learning and training perspective, it's hugely invaluable. From a customer service learning exper or a customer experience learning perspective, it's massively valuable. So there's real value in there. And it's not so much that Google's losing money on it as much as they are paying for the experiment and the results. So now, how does, that how does that project for us, the future of search, right? Let's get a little deeper into this. I will tell you this, the future of search, it's conversational. It's a blend of optimal and optimistic search strategies, of all of that game theory I touched on, of all of these different experiences that people have, right? If you actually dive into this, this is where I spend a lot of my time is looking into things like this, right? You see that, um, GT or GPT-3, if you go look this up, you will find out that pretty much weekly, we are making advances. Um, you are able to now give a keyword to the system and ask it to write a white paper for you. And, and it will come back with hundreds of words, dozens of pages that are all coherent, that are all grammatically accurate, that are all factual, that actually read like a human wrote it. And you cannot tell the difference. So that's a big deal. Um, there was a student uh, last year, he uh, 
used this system. He wrote his final paper. He submitted it. He got an A on it. And then he admitted to his teacher that he actually didn't deserve the A because the machine learning system wrote the paper for him. All he did was give it a paragraph of information and that was it. So big deal here that these systems exist. And Google actually as researchers, they're thinking that the whole concept of this language model, this deep learning, the GPT-3 and the systems that come out from that, that they will actually throw out the ranking approach and replace it with a single large AI language model. That's going to have a massive impact in our world because now suddenly you're not talking about search engine optimization, you're talking about search experience optimization. And that is something people really need to wrap their heads around. A lot of this is built on knowledge graphs. These are the core fundamental underlying systems that power Google, Airbnb, Home Depot, Amazon, Bing, all of these massive companies. All of them use knowledge graphs. And it's all about entities, attributes, and relationships. Those three things. An actual entity, the attributes of the entity, and the relationship between attributes and entities, attributes with entities. All of those pieces are what come together in the knowledge graph. This is the core of search in our future. And every business needs to be thinking about building their own knowledge graph about themselves so that they can plug directly into these systems in a deeper, more meaningful way. Now, Google's focus, it's all about UX. It's all about user experience. Everything that they've been doing over the last, we'll call it eight to 10 years, has been driving businesses toward improving their UX, being secure, having a mobile first presence, distance, relevance, prominence in the local space, expertise, authority, trust in general search, now core web vitals, the passage rank algorithms, all of these pieces are all geared toward improving user experience. And if you're wondering, hey, where does SEO fit in all this? Right there in that second to top step, SEO lives in core web vitals today because SEO is something you need to do in order to meet those scores and standards. That's it. You still have all of this other work to do. It's getting more complex. And the search coin, this is what it looks like today. This is what consumers want from Google. They want fast answers, accurate answers. They don't want to have to think about it. It has to be authoritative and trustworthy. So if it's coming from Google, they just want to trust it. Google wants it to be trustworthy. Now, here's what Google wants from the website. Website's got to be fast. It's got to be intuitive, easy to navigate. Information's got to be accurate. You must be trustworthy. You have to have some prominence. Prominence, not just the definition of the word. It's a combination of several things coming together to mark your prominence. You have to have proof of anything that you say. The dip, there has to be a depth to it, and you have to be an authority on a topic. And ultimately, it means you have to be recommendable. Would Google trust you to give to a consumer? If you are trustworthy, they will give you to that consumer. That's how that cycle works. Two sides, same coin. Now, is there a problem here? Of course, there's a problem here. User experience is terrible in general. Think about every time you've hit somewhere and you had a really bad experience. These stats speak for themselves, but here's the bottom line on it. 86% of buyers will pay for a better customer experience. They will pay more if a better customer experience. They will pay more for the product somewhere else if they get a better experience out of it. That is hugely problematic for a lot of businesses, especially if they're trying to win on an old price war strategy. That's not where you're at. The actual problems that we're seeing behind all this, incorrect display, websites are difficult to navigate, search results on and off the website are, are unhelpful. Pages have slow load times. There's no search component on a website. So when I get to you, I can't do what I'm already programmed to do, which is ask you for what I want. Now, the results of those programs, massively damaging. If the customer's not happy, roughly 13% of them will share with 15 or more people. Quick math on that, let's say you got 100 customers, 13 of them aren't happy with you. That's 195 other people that they will infect with their negative views about your business. Basic math says you will never have happier customers compared to unhappy customers. You can't keep up with that. And only one in 26 of these people will actually say anything to you. So you don't really get the feedback from the customer. You have to be diligent and do this user experience work up front because this is where search is going. 
It's all about conversational and visual AI. That's what we see developing at all of these massive companies today. And we've got devices with faster chipsets. If you've been following the i um, the uh, Apple thir or uh, the iPhone 13 launch rumors, uh, apparently it's coming with satellite communications abilities. What does that mean? Well, that means Wi-Fi 6 and 5G will be fully exploited, and you'll have another layer on that, which you know will open up more in the future. We're talking about integrated life experiences. You really can't buy an automobile today that doesn't have CarPlay or Android Auto in it, which means as smart as your phone is, your automobile is. You start conversations in your living room, continue them during your commute. You get to your office if you're going to your office. You continue that conversation during your break. You stop on your way home based on a list of things you've told your system to remind you about later in the day. That's where we're at. And it all leads to instant answers, at a glance access to the information that I want, and oral and visual experiences. That's where all of this is going. The path there is through the user experience, knowledge graphs, and making sure that you are truly an expert on your topic. You get those three areas covered, you're gonna survive and you're gonna take market share from the big dogs in your neighborhood. Gang, that's the presentation. Thank you so much. I know I'm a couple of minutes over here, but I don't wanna keep this any longer. If folks want me, feel free to track me down. I am all over the internet. Mark is saying this session can go on for another hour or more. <laughs> People want more. This is amazing. So much value, Dwayne. Thank well, you, you know so what, much. Let, let's do this. I'll put it out here right now. Why don't you guys give me a call? We'll do a webinar for everybody. If they want to show up for a separate webinar some other time, we'll dive much deeper for them. Woohoo! Love it. Dwayne, if you have an extra five minutes, join the next session because there was a question that I want to make sure that you have a chance to answer. Uh, we don't have time during this session, but I oh, will cool. post it in the comment in the next session. Everyone, thank you so much. I'll see you in the next session. Dwayne, it was my pleasure. Chat with you really soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.